Okay, good morning. So today we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about climate and how climate affects ecology. And um, we're going to talk a bit about the differences between or what, what we mean when, by, by climate as opposed to weather, the different things that uh, influence climate at a, at a global and at a, a landscape and at a regional at a regional level, and then the how climate influences ecology, how climate can determine which animals are found or plants are found in specific areas, and then also in a, a little adjunct a little diversion from the the material in the textbook or that the core course material. We're going to talk a bit about climate change and the ecology of, of climate change and how species or plants and animals are, are influenced by, by climate change. Um, and we're going to shift into some of the, the current research on that topic at the moment. And that should be a nice little interesting segue at the end of the, the, end of the lecture. But before we get there, so at the, well, the, the very first lectures in this, or in this series, we defined ecology in its simplest form as a study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. So for the next three or four lectures, I'm going to talk about the physical environment, the char specific characteristics of this physical environment. Namely, climate, which we'll talk about today, air and water in the next lecture, and then soil, as uh, and the, the final or the third lecture of this series. As we talk about these, there's three things to to keep in mind and to and to bear in mind, and this just follows on from what we've discussed in the the lectures up to now. First of all, that living organisms will evolve rapidly to fit their environment. So environment is determined by these factors here. Organisms within that, through processes of natural selection, will rapidly be adapted towards life within that environment. Next, that environments can change too, both slowly, as we'll see, and rapidly, in the case of things like climate change or extreme weather events, perhaps. And then finally, that organisms can also alter their physical environment. So at the very, one of the very, very first slides in one of the, the first lecture, we looked at how organisms in a forest can alter the, the environment that, the, that, the, that they're residing in. But that works at a, at, a, at a much larger scale. If we think of the oxygen that everybody in this room uses to breathe, that oxygen is a, a product of other organisms within our environment. So if we want to understand the, the ecology of the environment, or to understand how species interact with their environment, we need to understand both the, the biology of these living organisms, of the species of interest, and also the characteristics of the environment that they're, that they're residing in. So we start today, as I said, with, with climate. And when I speak about climate, it's important to get a definition or make sure that, you've, that this definition is clear in your head that climate and weather are two very different things. They both involve the same, the same ideas, the same terms of temperature, humidity, precipitation. But weather is... A very short is relatively a, a short-term concept. It's snowy at the moment. We're having a, a, a temporary drought period, and weather will, will fluctuate rapidly. In contrast, climate is a much more long-term or, or a stable, kind of relatively comparatively stable concept, and it's determined by things like the the solar energy to the earth the movement of, of winds and or the movement of that energy around the earth by, by wind patterns and by ocean currents. The 
the, the basis of all of this, the basis of this, of this, of this energy of, of temperature, and as we'll see also precipitation, is solar radiation. Is solar radiation from the sun, the landing here, and influencing the, influencing the climate on the Earth. So this plot up here in the top left should be pretty self-explanatory, self but pretty clear to, or pretty evident to anybody here as to what's going on. We've got shortwave radiation, solar radiation comes, hits the Earth. It's either absorbed or reflected. Reflected radiation often are re reflected as long wave radiation. This long wave radiation either passes through, reflected all the way out, passes through the atmosphere, or is, hits cloud bodies, reflected back in, back, back down to Earth, or is trapped by within the atmosphere. And the key in this, this trapping is that um, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, is a, a, an, an agent of, the, of this trapping. And the reason, if, we, if there was no carbon dioxide anywhere in our atmosphere, the Earth would be around about 30 degrees colder than it is today, and life wouldn't exist. The reason that this planet is habitable is because of greenhouse gases and the, the warming, the insulating effect that they have on on our atmosphere. As we, as we see later on, that as you increase these greenhouse gases, you increase this insulating effect, and that has, has repercussions in terms of climate. The radiation that's hitting the Earth is not evenly dispersed. All parts of the Earth do not have a, a similar level of, of warming, a similar level of radiated warming. The albedo is the, albedo effect, is the fraction of incoming radiation which is reflected back out. And here we see that this has a, a, a glo global pattern, though there are global patterns in this, that in the poles, or at the, it's highest in the poles and lowest in the oceanic region. Anybody got a, an idea why that might be? Why might you get a... Sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's one of it. We'll get to that. But this is directly, say, it's com coming in, and in some areas it's reflected back, in some areas it's, it's absorbed. Snow. Perfect. Yeah, snow. It's simple as these areas are white for at least half the year. These areas are generally, or at least the oceans, are generally blue. They absorb more radiation. So incoming radiation is not evenly distributed across the Earth. Or due to a beta effect, the, from a ra per purely radiation perspective, the Earth does not warm equally. But we also see fluctuations in the amount of radiation with, with latitude and with seasons. So in this plot here, we've got by, by month and the amount of shortwave radiation hitting, hitting a spot. And we see in the blue line here, equatorial regions, it's pretty standard over the year. As, as we move north, 30 degrees north in green, uh, 60 and then 90 degrees north, it becomes more, it becomes intensified you get a, a greater cyclical pattern in this degree of warming, or this spread of warming. And the reason why is what you were getting to earlier. That, so there are there's, there's, there's two reasons for this. The, and they're both due to the geometry of, of the Earth and the, how that influences solar radiation hitting the Earth. First of all, as everybody here knows and hopefully agrees, the Earth is round. As a result of this, radiation hitting the Earth from a, a direct source will be in, will the, 
area over which that radiation is spread will be a, a function of the curvature of the Earth. So where that radiation comes from the sun hits the Earth right on the equator. It's a very direct hit. All that energy is spread over a very small area. Alternatively, if the Earth where it fits, hits closer to the poles, that same degree or that same amount of energy is spread over a, a much larger area. So that energy has, it's, it's, it's more diffuse. Also, I don't know how well it's come out here, but around the Earth we are surrounded by atmosphere, where this direct energy comes through onto at, uh, equatorial regions. It has to pass through a very small amount of atmosphere. Pass through. At the, the polar regions, it must pass through a larger amount of atmosphere. So this atmosphere will absorb some of that energy, will reduce the amount of that energy which hits the, hits the Earth. Second, the Earth, as well as being round, in its, it's tilted in its, in its rotations. It tilts, it's tilted on a, an axis of around about 23.5 degrees. This has a, a big effect for, for people who live in places like Canada or Ireland or any, any temperate region. And to understand this effect, if we follow through uh, an annual cycle of uh, an Earth, one, one rotation of the Earth around the sun. So we start in the middle of June, the summer solstice, where the winter, or day and night are, are of equal length. But, sorry. So where the, long, the longest day of the year. We see that the Earth is tilted towards, towards the sun. So here, day is longer than the night. We move sorry, to the equinox, where day and night are of, of, EV, of equal length. And then in the winter, here in Canada, we are now tilted away from the sun. So our, our period of daylight is shorter than our period of night, so we receive less solar radiation in a 24-hour in a period. So the radiation hitting the Earth is or the degree of warming is, is uneven. And if we take that to its, its logical extreme, we'll get a situation where the equatorial regions are, 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 are desert, are, are, are totally dry, arid, and that the polar regions are a, a frozen wasteland. That doesn't, doesn't happen. And the reason that doesn't happen is, again, due to uh, aspects of physics which, which help us out. As the, so essentially, the wind currents will redistribute the, the, this warming, will redistribute this air, this, this energy ar around the globe. The simplest way to think of this is a... Two, two current systems, one operating in the northern hemisphere, one in the southern hemisphere. The equatorial regions warm faster, they, they, become, they become warmer than the polar regions. As this happens, that air, that warmer air, starts to rise. Cold air from the side floods in underneath it and forces the warm air back out over the colder air. That results in these global patterns or potential global, hypothetical global patterns of, of convection, of energy transport from the poles, or sorry, from the equator to the poles. And while it's a quite, we've, we've got through some of the complexities of that in subsequent slides, that is in, in essence what happens. That you get a movement of due to due to winds and oceanic currents, you get a redistribution of heat from the equator towards the poles. So that's the, the simplest case. 
it doesn't unfortunate or fortunate it doesn't quite work out like that rather than air from the equator going cycling all the way to the north pole and back again it usually typically only reaches around about 30 degrees north before it cools cool sufficiently that it will, the air will start to sink down again. So we get, three, rather than one cycle, essentially what we're looking at is three distinct air cells moving air from the equator northwards towards the poles. So the first is the Hadley cell, which is this equatorial system. Next, we talk about the, the polar cell, where the exact same process is occurring. That at the, the southern extent of that cell, the air is warmer than it is at the northern extent. So this warm air rises, and colder air comes in underneath to, to, to replace it. And we get this latitudinal shift in, in, in air current. The, the feral cell, which falls between the Hadley cell and the polar cell, that operates on the, in the, on, the, on the reverse. So here, the air is moving in the, an anticyclone. We could think of air as moving, as, moving north, as moving north or south, but as we see in these plots, or in the, in the arrows, it's also moving generally east or west. And the reason for this is what's known as the Coriolis effect. And to think about this, one of the easiest ways to think about this or to get a grasp of this concept is to think if you were sitting on the equator and you were to fire a, a rocket directly north at 100 kilometers an hour, whatever. Your rocket will, will travel north at that speed. But because you're on the equator that's moving eastwards, your rocket is also traveling eastwards at 400 kilometers. So that's fine if you stay on, on the equator, if you stay at a, a point that's constantly moving eastwards. As you move further north, your, your rocket is covering greater covering more distance. So it starts to shift, its trajectory will shift to, to the east. And that's exactly what happens when, uh, with, with, with the airflow, with, with the air that is moving, moving north. Due to the rotation of the Earth, the airflow moving north will be deflected to the east. And similarly, air and water moving southward, or moving towards the equator rather, rather than north and south, will be deflected to the west. When you combine both of these patterns, this latitudinal movement due to temperature and longitudinal movement, east-west movement, due to the Coriolis effect, you get the prevailing wind patterns which, which, which govern the Earth, which are found across the Earth. And essentially the, the, the clearest are from, a, are from our own experience to work on, on our own area, what we see is this current of air moving eastwards along the from, from the from the Gulf up along the eastern coast of the US, moving across toward, towards Europe. And that that pattern, that, that flow of air is gov governed by the processes we, we we've just discussed, but will ha has a a great effect on the the biology of, of, of the, on, the, on the climate of the areas that it influences. And we'll, discuss, we'll cover that in a, in a couple of moments. 
the next thing to consider is also that both the effect of radiation and the, the effects of, of air transfer through, through, through the trade winds effectively control the, the precipitation rates across the globe or determine the, the precipitation rates across the globe. So we start in equatorial regions, which have, in general, the, the highest levels of precipitation. Here we've got the, high, the most intensive solar radiation, the highest amount of warming. So here we've got air rising rapidly. As this air rises, it starts to cool, it condenses, it loses a lot of the moisture. The moisture condenses and falls as rain. So in this equatorial region, we have the highest rainfall. This air has now lost a lot of its moisture. It's lost a lot of the, uh, you know, the following, up, following the, the rainfall in the equatorial region. When that air itself starts to cool and starts to sink back down, as you said, at around about 30 degrees north, it's very dry air. It doesn't, it's not containing any much moisture anymore. So this is why at around about 30 degrees north, we see large desert regions. So just through the, the process, even without <coughs> factoring in the, the roles of the, of the trade winds, or the, the effect of the, the transfer of, of air, we can see this effect, of, or this direct effect, from, um, from radiation governing the relocation or governing the global trends in precipitation. But to take this on a, in a level further, we see here the typical trends as there are, as there are trade winds, there are, and as there are typical patterns of, of airflow, there are also typical patterns of, of ocean currents. Ocean currents, for the purposes of, of this lecture, are predominantly driven by, by airflow. They, are gener they will generally follow the direction of the trade winds, which is why the, the arrows we see here, again, we're going to deal with this area that the North Atlantic, quite closely represent what we see here in, the terms in, the, in relation to the trade winds. So North Atlantic, we've got a, a movement toward, towards the pole, a movement eastward, northeastwards. The polar regions, we've got a mover, movement southwestward. And also equatorial regions, a movement southwestward. So these trends, this transfer of, 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 of air due to solar radiation also moves water. And water holds a lot more heat than air. So as the, the trade winds push the water around the globe, they're also pushing big, big blocks of heat around the globe. And this is what's, what happens here in this North Atlantic. And we think of the, the North Atlantic drift and the, and the Gulf Stream. So here you've got pockets and large oceanic pocket of, wa of warm water, which is transported northwards up the, the eastern coast of the US, and then deflects across the north of the Atlantic Ocean to, to northern Europe. In contrast, polar, polar, polar currents coming down over the, the Labrador Straits. And this is why if you go to areas of, of northern Canada and areas of northern Europe, the, the climate is extremely different. The, where here you've got areas which are ice-bound for, for six months of the year. In, at the, the same latitude 
in, in Northern Europe. You've got places in Ireland which are waterlogged for 12 months of the year. And these patterns are, are repeated ac across the globe in, in different areas. We see the same, the same physics, the same processes governing both temperature and precipitation at a, at a, at a global scale. So that's, that's at a global scale, and that's how these continental patterns move, our air patterns move energy, move solar energy around, around the globe. But the vast majority of species that we as ecologists are interested in, or systems that we as ecologists might be interested in, operate at a, a far more regional level, or are influenced at a far more regional level. So we need to understand geographic, things which influence geographic variation, or local regional variation in climate. And we're going to talk about two of those over the next couple of slides. <coughs> the first is this, is that the rain shadow effect. So to understand that, we have to take a, a trip towards the west coast, where the prevailing winds are coming in, are, are moving northeasterly, coming in off the, off the ocean. And they are moisture rich. So as they come on land, they hit the mountains, hit the Rocky Mountains, the air is forced upwards. As it's forced upwards, it cools, the moisture it's holding condenses and falls as rain. So you get a, a high degree of rainfall on the windward side of the mountain, high degree of precipitation, windward side of the mountain range. Whereas once the rain or once the, the air has, clear, has passed over the, over the mountains, it's dropped the majority of its moisture. So on the, on the leeward side of the mountains, you get very arid, semi-desert regions. So this is an interaction. This is where you need to think of an interaction between the, the climate you're studying or the, the, the geography of the area you're studying and, and where it's located. And this works not just at a, at a, at a, at a mountain scale or at a, a landscape scale. If you are interested in looking at what's going on, what different species are found at different elevations along this mountain. These effects will determine the degree of rainfall at, <coughs> at different at levels of altitude. There will also be effects such as where the, the, the orientation of your, of your system, uh, where if it's facing southwards, it's going to be warmer, it'll receive more sunlight, facing northwards, receive less sunlight. The second of these processes that we want to, to think about are these more regional processes. It's what's known as the lake effect. So I mentioned earlier that water holds a lot more heat than land. Water is a, a better vector of, of heat than land. And because of that, land will heat faster and cool quicker than water. So if we have a, an area of land beside a large lake, and we think we go through a 24-hour a cycle. So during the day, the land warms up rapidly. The land becomes warmer than, than, than the water beside it. So you've got a, a warm area and a cool area. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the air of sitting above this, this landscape? Will it remain constant? Anybody? So you've got a 
Think of this as a, a, a music on a pale down or a pared down version of what's happening at uh, a, on a global level. So on a global <coughs> level, we have areas which are receiving a lot of direct sunlight in the, in the equatorial region, and areas which are see, receiving very little or relatively small amount of sunlight, relatively small amount of solar energy. What happens to the air that's sitting above those two areas? So the air that's sitting above the warmer area will rise and will start to, as it rises, the air that's sitting above the cooler area will move in to replace it. The exact same process will happen in, in this uh, lake land scenario. We've got a, an area of warm land and an area of cooler lake. The, war, the air above the, above the land will rise and the cool air above, on, above the lake will, will flood in to replace it. And we'll get a, a cyclical effect during the day of offshore winds, or of, sorry, of onshore winds as cool air from the lake is drawn in onto the land to replace the the warm air that's rising up off the, off the land. What happens during the night? Can you say something? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'll get the exact opposite effect. So during the night, the land will cool quicker than the, than the lake. So the lake now has, has warmer air than the land. The air above the, the land floods out underneath the, the warm air in the lake. It's more dense. It floods out underneath the warm air of the lake. So you get a, an offshore wind during the, during the night. And that's characteristic of, of many areas, especially areas close to, to, large, to large water bodies, areas around the Great Lakes. Up to now, we've talked about these, these fixed patterns, almost, that, the, that due to the, the Earth's geometry, due to set factors, we get fixed global patterns of radiation or of, 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 of airflow. It's important to remember that when we're dealing with natural systems and asking questions about ecology, we're dealing with systems which are inherently a lot more complex than this. Two of the, the main patterns that we see in, in climate, and certainly at a, at a global level in climate, are the El Nino and La Nina cycles in the Pacific and Milankovitch cycles. To start with the El Nino and La Nina, these are related to changes in the, the water current layers in the, or water current trends in the, the Pacific Ocean, where you get a, a, sh a shift or a, a, a breakdown in the, the current of air or the current of water, which is bringing warm water to the, to the, co to the western coast of South America, say, to, across the Pacific. And that has global repercussions. Here in Canada, we are somewhat insulated from the, the most extreme effects because, or at least here in New Brunswick we are, because we're on we have a, a, the continent of America basically insulating us from the, the effect of what's going on in the Pacific. However, we do see that El Nino years here will typically be a bit warmer, maybe a bit, a bit wetter. La Nina years often will be cooler here. The Milankovitch cycle is a much longer cycle. It's regulated by shifts in uh, shifts in the Earth's trajectory, so. and that occurs at around about hundred thousand year timescales, and that will be related to 
slow warming periods and cooling periods. And cooling periods during this Melanchthon cycle are, is when the, the last glaciation, the last ice ages occurred. So these patterns are, are evident across the globe. We know that there are differences in, in climate across the globe due to what, what we've discussed up to now. We know from the lectures up to now that the bio, biotic communities, the ecology of an area, is determined largely by its environment. So if you get a, a wet, humid, comparatively stable, or area with stable temperature, you'll get a very rich, diverse flora and fauna. Alternatively, if you've got high variability, highly fluctuating areas, your, the species which are found there will be adapted to, to life in this region. And this works at a global scale. It also works on more regional scales. So when we think of these are the breakdown of, of ecoregions in, the, in East, eastern Canada. And an ecoregion essentially is a, a defined area or a, an, an ecosystem which is defined by distinctive geography and receives uniform radiation and precipitation. So these are areas which we can look at the flora and fauna and look at the, the climate and say it's characteristic, these different areas are characterized by, or the, the flora and fauna in this area is characterized by a specific climate. And we can break these down into very, very specific and very small regions. In New Brunswick here, we sit within this Atlantic maritime climate. Even in a more specific level, Fredericton is situated in the maritime lowlands. And there's hundreds of these specific areas defined across Canada based on their flora, fauna, and climate. So these trends that we see at a, at a, at a global scale are reciprocated. That's what I was trying to get at with this idea of the, the mountain effect and the, the lake effect, that these trends are reciprocated at a more, far more local level. And we know that species breadth, the presence of different species, is determined by, by climate. So what happens if climate changes? So we know there's a, a great deal of information, a great deal of data at the moment, which showing, showing that we are going through a period of unprecedented climate change. And predictions for future climate, depending on, on what we do, in terms of our, our, our emissions, how the, our emissions are influencing greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect will determine the, the future climate, or will influence the future climate across the globe. And this is a, two different predictions from IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for their two predictions under no change, to, or under if we, if we do something to try and modify our environment, or mo modify our climate, versus no change to, to what we're doing at the moment. Predicted future temperatures increases from of anything from two to five degrees, and most severe in the, in the polar regions. So this is, this is, a, this, can be, this, is, this is worrying. This is, if you're interested in climate change ecology, this is also interesting. How will nature respond to this change, these changes? And how is nature responding to these changes? So to understand this, first of all, we have to think about how organisms, how organisms are affected by, by temperature. So this plot here on the, the y-axis, we have the, the amount of energy expended by an organism as a function of, of its body temperature. And here we have poikilotherms, a cold-blooded species, or cold-blooded animals, and warm-blooded animals. And we see that for, for both, there's a, a range that, of temperatures that which, in which they can be active. 
for but for and also for both there's a range of temperatures in which they are most effective and these can be defined as the uh, the performance breadth and the the, the tolerance range <coughs> of of a species if a species is in, in a region, and we, we're taking a, the, the curve for a cold-blooded or, organism here. If a species is in a region, and that region the te in, goes through a change in temperature, the, especially for cold-blooded species which are unable to uh, insulate themselves against temperature, or are lesser able to insulate themselves against changes in temperature, their success, their fitness, will, will be influenced, will change. So here we've got a shift in, in relative fitness for species at body temperature A. If you increase body temperature, or body temperature decreases, fitness decreases, body temperature increases, fitness decreases. So if we, so species at a, an organism or at an individual level, at the level of a, an individual organism, are, are, are influenced by, by temperature. They have areas in which they're, they're most effective, but they also have thermal tolerances. So this figure is, I'm going to put a couple of these papers in, the, in D2L so you can access them. This is from a paper that was published just a, a couple of years ago. So we're moving from <coughs> textbook ecology right the way through to current cutting edge thought on how climate change will influence species. So we've got a plot here for, for birds and for mammals. And different groups of birds and mammals are color-coded by different colors. I don't know if you can see these gray lines underneath. Essentially, what we've got is, or what we're looking at, is across a degree of latitude and, and a temperature range. We're looking at the, the thermal tolerance levels for a particular species. So one species here, its thermal tolerance range is between 20 and 30 degrees. It's the majority of species that down at minus 40 degrees latitude, say. If we follow that through, you get different, generally different ranges in different latitudes. What happens, and this is characteristic of, of birds and of mammals, so what we're asking as ecologists is what happens if you change the, the temperature in a region? If instead of, the, so the gray bars are the, the general temperature, the temperature ranges within, at that latitude. What happens if you change that gray bar? If you change the the temperature range where the species is found. These plots here show the, the difference between the species thermal tolerance and the ambient temperature in the region. Again, just focus on the top two for now. For under current scenarios, under current situations, for birds and for mammals. In the most case, in most cases, the species thermal tolerance is above the ambient temperature. So that's, that's okay. The species hasn't reached a, a, point, a cutoff point, a point at which it cannot exist in this ambient temperature, in the current, within the current temperature. It's the majority of species fall into this safety area. Once it's above that line, it can be considered safe. Where it's below that line, there's a mismatch, and the species is, its temperature tolerance is below the current ambient temperature. 
that does exist in nature, and we can talk about that later if you want, but we don't have much time for it now. If you increase ambient temperature, what's going to happen? A greater number of species will fall below that line. That a greater number of species are now residing in areas where they are, due to a shift in temperature, their temperature tolerance is now falls outside the range of the ambient temperature that they're existing in. This happens across the globe, and it, it's bad news for, for, for species. Essentially, these two plots here just show the, a different representation of that same data. The, the degree of the number of the proportion species which are at risk, which are under threat due to due to climate, due to being outside their, their temperature range. And at a globe, this is just showing that it's not isolated to specific regions. This is a, a global pattern in both birds and in mammals. What happens, how species respond to this, is a big question, a big, one of the main current questions in, in ecology, trying to understand what is going to happen as climate continues to warm. There's two scenarios. The first is that species will just migrate. That populate, either individuals will migrate to an area uh, which is more suitable, or through selection, populations will be extirpated, will become extinct in areas which they're not able to live due to climate change. But instead, the population will grow in areas which become habitable for them through climate change. That can work for animals which, such as, such as birds, insects, mammals, which can move easily over continental scales or marine fish. It's, that's not as, as simple for species which are restricted to a geographic area such as fish in, water, in uh, river basins, or maybe restricted to specific lakes, or maybe restricted by, to specific mountain ridges, that they can't move over, over grasslands. This is where, this is a, where, where, where we get to when we try to think about the effect of, of climate on ecology. The two things are, are massively interlinked, and while climate will determine what species are found where, future changes in climate will determine which species are, can, can adapt and which species cannot. So in the next lecture, we're going to move on from this. We're going to talk about water and how, how water influences species distribution.